Okay, um, I'm introducing myself. Um, I, I'm, I've been involved in this uh, for 43 years. This, uh, I started work at Frame in February, February the 1st of 1976. So it's been uh, a, a, a relatively long road. It's amazing to me that it is as long as that. It seems like it's just gone by in a flash. So um, I'm, I'm not going to spend a, a lot of time talking about my background. I'd in, uh, instead like to spend a little bit of time reflecting on frame. So um, John stopped in 1959. <laughs> there were some reviews of the book, not terribly complimentary. Um, uh, through in 1960, early 60s, um, and then nothing. Um, and then in 69, a frame was established. And um, also in the United States, uh, there was a new organization called United Action for Animals. It was formed by Eleanor Sealing, who had been working with the Humane Society of the United States and got upset at their lack of, shall we say, outreach or lack of radical thinking. And she went off and formed her own organization, United Action for Animals, which was promoting alternatives. And so she was one of the first real um, ar architects and advocates for the idea of alternatives. And in 1969, Mrs. Hegarty uh, of Frame picked this up and uh, began to um, uh, build um, what, was, what was to become Frame in its full-fledged um, glory. So, I'm really going to focus just on a few years, the three years or so following um, February of um, uh, 76. I finished my biochemistry DPhil at Oxford um, on control of intermediate metabolisms in 1975. I came from South Africa. I was intending to go back there for a variety of reasons I decided not to. And so the question at that point was, should I go continue on as a researcher or should I stay um, as uh, do something different. And I wasn't terribly good at the bench, not uh, sufficiently um, detail-oriented, and so I, th but I spent a lot of time in university consultative committees, and I enjoyed working with people, and so I thought, well, science policy sounds like something. I, I love science, I love, uh, I enjoy working with people. Uh, policy might be my met here, and I applied for a few jobs, but was unsuccessful and eventually ended up working for Robert Maxwell at Pergamon Press. Maxwell as the fellow who later committed suicide by jumping off or was pushed, nobody really knows which, off his boat uh, somewhere in, uh, off the coast of Spain. Um, so uh, the, this was an interesting period, six months. I spent time doing an abstract journal, and um, I realized after three that this was not going to be my life's work and started looking around for alternative opportunities and at that time came across an ad to be scientific administrator of Frame. I remembered seeing some of their literature as a student and thinking, you know, there's some, in there's some interesting issues here. I was always interested in, in the role of methods in scientific discovery. And so I, I, I applied and um, later discovered there weren't very many Oxford DPhils applying for the position. Um, and so perhaps not surprisingly, at the end of the day, the Hegarty's hired me to be the scientific administrator. And so, so I, I, when I got to Frame, um, uh, as I said, it was launched by Mrs. Hegarty, Dorothy Hegarty, in 1969. And in 1976, it occupied a two-room commercial space in Raines Park. Um, this is the front of that particular space. Um, and uh, there was a, uh, the, the front room, and behind it was uh, the storeroom essentially, it was where my desk was, and out, you went out the back door and there was a toilet out the back, and there was a big hole in the concrete in front of the toilet, so one had to be somewhat careful um, negotiating this <laughs> at the time. It was eventually fixed, but it was, so this was, this was frame in, the, in 76. The annual budget was 8,000 pounds, so we weren't exactly rolling in cash. And the staff consisted of myself and a half-time secretary. There had been one other scientific uh, member before me. Uh, I was informed that he had left in a rush, gone off to South Africa. Uh, and uh, the came, the, this message came with a certain amount of criti critical um, comment. Um, and um, I hadn't, 
I, l I learned later why he left, but um, at the time did not know. And I do want to mention one other piece of the story was that uh, it, it used to be a haberdashery. And the reason why that's important was because they had this big cabinet along one wall that was built to maintain, sort of keep the skeins of wool and all the other stuff, and it had glass uh, in fr at the front of the drawers. And these drawers perfectly contained full scap paper, not a, not a, a size that people in America maybe um, it's more like legal size, but it's, uh, these were perfect drawers for full scap, so they became Frames filing cabinet. So everything was on full scap, put in these, these drawers, and we had drawers of pamphlets and leaflets and various other materials uh, in that. And Michael later sawed it in half. It had to be sawed in half in order to move it and get it into the frame office in, in uh, Nottingham and kept it. Unfortunately, it has now gone the way of all furniture, but um, it was, uh, it, or does Michael, Michael has it? It's gone to a good place. It's gone to a good place, okay. It'll be used. It'll be used. <laughs> so, so uh, just a, 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 a little aside, and this is Dorothy Hegarty um, with a somewhat younger Michael. Um, and the new logo that they established in the 1980s, I guess it would have been early 80s. Um, so Mrs. Hegarty was an interesting lady. She grew up in, in uh, Shanghai, married her husband Jack Hegarty in Shanghai. She, by her own admission, was a secretary and, but mostly a, a social butterfly. Um, and, but she learned secretarial skills in Shanghai, and that's important for a later part of the story. Um, and um, she was part of the National Anti she joined the National anti Section Society. She was vegetarian, vegan before it became at all um, a, a fad. And um, she was, um, went to the, and she was an anti vivisectionist, was very upset about the use of animals in research and went to the National anti Section Society and clashed there with Lady Dowding, who was the wife of Lord Dowding, the Battle of Britain um, hero. And Lady Dowding and Mrs. Hegarty did not get on, and eventually Lady Dowding kicked Mrs. Hegarty out of the National anti Section Society, and she went off and formed Frame almost as a club with which to beat the National anti Section Society. I've always felt that that was part of why she did this, um, and, and she always insisted uh, uh, that Frame should be a scientific organization. It was a scientific organization. It was not an animal welfare organization. So we had to, we constantly had this discussion and commentary about, well, what is this scientific? And she had two um, advisors. Um, Dr. Charles Foister was a retired plant pathologist. He was one advisor. And uh, Dr. Terry Hegarty, her son, was also a plant pathologist, I think, a plant biologist, um, and was up in Scotland, uh, as far away, where his wife could be as far away as she could possibly be from Mrs. Hegarty. Um, and um, the, uh, they provided a lot of the early scientific advice. And, and Charles Foister was a wonderful old man, um, and, you know, sort of good head on his shoulders, and was very diplomatic, tactful, and everything else, and was able to deal with a lot of this, these issues. And the products that Frame produced in those years were um, Atla. They came to this idea that they needed to bring uh, the attention of scientists to alternative methods. And so they produced Atla, which was this journal that was produced twice a year um, and contained about 100 abstracts of papers that talked about non-animal methods of whatever sort. And in those days, it was primarily t uh, computer science, uh, computer modeling, and tissue culture. Um, and these abstracts were searched for by a man by the name of Mr. Wright um, and uh, Dr. Lakshmi. These were the two primary individuals who were, would go through the libraries and search for abstracts and then send us these uh, printouts, these old computer printouts with the, um, uh, the paper, on, uh, you know, with the indentations on either side and send it us to us and we would then sort of put them into uh, to Atla. Um, and I was concerned that this was uh, not as, a, uh, as productive as it might be, and so we suggested revising and expanding ATLA to include review articles and news items. 
This came as a considerable uh, um, problem for Mrs. Hegarty, who felt that uh, it, might say, it might change Atler's mission, it might change Atler's reception by the scientists. Um, uh, but fortunately, Terry Hegarty said, yes, we should do that. Terry was really my way of addressing his mother's concerns and paranoia that frame was being changed in ways that were, were a problem. So, so we did, uh, we, we revised Atla, we brought in, and that's when we brought in Michael. Um, he was, he did a review for us on tissue culture of Xenopus levis amphibian tissue culture. And, and we uh, did a number of other, produced a number of other pamphlets and fact sheets, uh, and included what price vanity, which Michael may mention later, because they ended up discarding it. But it was an interesting publication. This was one of Mrs. Hegarty's real um, uh, sort of hopes with uh, Lady Darding was that they would produce a pamphlet on cosmetic testing. And it became a sort of a, a, a leaflet that was distributed widely by some activists in South London. So um, I'd, I'd like to just note that in 1976, this was, uh, the, this was an extract from a letter to science uh, published by um, several uh, scientists at the uh, U.S. Army base in Fort Dietrich, at the labs in Fort Dietrich. And Hegley, Andrew Hegley, was one of the authors. Um, um, and they said something that could be, we, we'd see today in the literature. I mean, it was, uh, I, I remember sort of coming across this and saying this is extraordinary. Um, but that was saying we should be able to do end toxicology. And so this was something that, uh, toxicology testing on animals. And so this is one of the influential items that I found while I spent my time in the Royal Society of Medicine. Um, there were several rules at frame. Um, we used to have a reading of the Cron file of all letters sent out every Monday morning. And in my 2.5 years at Frame, I was the longest lasted employee at Frame from 1969 through to 1980. We had nine secretaries while well, in that two and a half years, and the first secretary lasted nine months, Linda. She was, had the patience of Job and put up with Mrs. Hegarty, us criticizing her English and criticizing her punctuation and criticizing her typing for nine months. The others lasted a month to three months at the most. Um, and that was when I learned not to use the same word in, a, in one sentence. And that's also when I learned that there really isn't a synonym for interest. So um, if you wanted to say I'm interested in this, there was no synonym. And I was expected to be in the office at 9 a.m. and to leave at 5 p.m. She was very concerned that I was there for too long and that um, I would get phone calls from Mr. Hegarty at 4.55 p.m. to find out, ask me some <coughs> question about the accounts but it was really to check that I was still there. Um, and absolutely no truck with AV and animal welfare groups. But we did have some interaction with U4, and I did read Russell and Birch while I was there. I believe Harry Roussel, or maybe Professor Sir William Payton, uh, who was the um, president of the Research Defense Society, who wanted to find out why an Oxford D4 was working for Frame. Um, and my might have mentioned, me, mentioned the book to me. And my highlights, Michael has his own, were the high fidelity fallacy and the statistical items referred to, referring to the work of chance at Birmingham. But I had to argue to be able to spend any time at all with U4 and its advisors. But I uh, want to point out one important connection. Uh, Alistair Warden later became um, chair of the Frame Toxicity Committee, and he was also the founder of the Huntington Research Center and uh, one of the early editors of the U4 Laboratory Animals Handbook. Some of the positive developments, uh, in those days our victories were letters to the Times and Telegraph, especially the Telegraph, and Mrs. Hegarty was a good conservative, um, and uh, invited to present testimony on the LD50 before the Home Office Special Inquiry. We built a positive relationship with Bernard Dixon, who was then editor of New Scientist. We expanded ATLA, and I ended up my time at Frame um, organizing a symposium at the Royal Society that would, Michael was one of the speakers at it, and um, uh, producing a proceedings and a toxicity committee. And I would like to just notice, point out, if you, if you standardize laboratory animal use across the world, this is the type of curve you get. So the peak is one, uh, and it was 50 million for the US and uh, six and a half million for the UK, including breeding procedures, 
and 1.7 million for the Netherlands. And Michael and I started when that peak occurred. So I, I'm not trying to claim any particular responsibility here. It's positive. <laughs> you know, but, uh, you know. And then, um, you know, um, this is what, if you do use the Google Ngram technology and sort of scroll, find out uh, alternatives to animal testing um, or alternatives to animal research, this is what you get. And uh, rises up to 2,000 and then has begun to fall off. And I think that's because we're using three R's much more than alternatives today. In conclusion, Dorothy Hegarty had her foibles, but she did as much as anybody to put alternatives on the map, but she was not much interested in Russell and Birch while I was at Frame. I would very much express my gratitude to her for the opportunities she provided and the path that she launched me onto, and never thought I would personally see the day when I could say with some conviction and much supporting evidence that we are nearing the day when routine animal testing would end. It, it has been a most rewarding 40 plus years. Thank you very much.